The show is set in the year 1962 of a parallel universe. The Axis power comprising Nazi Germans and the Imperial Japanese won World War II and are now the rulers of the entire world. In this universe, the US president-elect Franklin D. was assassinated amidst the war and the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki never happened. Instead, the Germans dropped an atomic bomb on Washington, D.C., and weakened the Allied countries. In the current world, the Germans rule over all of Europe and Africa, and the Empire of Japan controls all of Asia. However, the point of power is set in the former U.S. which has since been divided into two parts. Western North America ruled by the Japanese and Eastern and Midwestern North America is controlled by the Greater Nazi Reich also called the GNR. The American flag has a swastika instead of stars, indicating its complete surrender to the Nazis. Although the two empires won the war hand in hand, there has been a Cold War type relationship between them ever since. It is said that after the death of the current Fuhrer, Hitler, his next in command will take over all the Japanese states and declare themselves the rulers of the world. In both empires, Americans are subjected to racism and have fewer rights than Germans and Japanese in their respective states. The police are allowed to kill any American if they find them suspicious without having to answer to anyone. There is a neutral zone between two former American states that encompasses the Rocky Mountains. It serves as a neutral zone where no rules of either empire work. It is also a hiding zone for the resistance group that is constantly protesting for their rights and freedom. Then, we are introduced to Joe Blake who lives in Nazi-occupied New York. Tired of being a slave to the Nazis, he is looking to be part of a resistance group. From various sources, he has finally discovered the address of the New York leader of the group. As he travels to the said place, we see the Times Square billboards filled with Nazi propaganda and advertisements about the Fuhrer. The headquarters turns out to be a shipping company and the leader is a manager named Don. Joe tells him that he is a rebel but Don laughs at his face. Joe has gotten their address which means he is already qualified to be their ally but according to Don, someone like him will blurt out all their secrets to the police if caught. Joe tells the manager that his will to fight is not that weak and Don ultimately gives him a chance. As his first task, he is asked to drive a truck filled with coffee machines to Cannon City, Colorado which is a neutral zone. Joe inquires what else the truck contains but he is asked to do as told without asking many questions. Right before he leaves, the place is raided by the Nazis. Joe manages to drive away while Don is caught and arrested. It turns out that the third highest Nazi rank officer opened group and fear Smith initiated the raid. He used to be a US Army captain before he joined hands with the Nazis and is now loyal to them. When told about Joe and the truck, the open group and fear orders his people to catch the truck at any cost. Then, we are taken to San Francisco, a Japan-ruled city in the West. Juliana is an Aikido expert and a happy American living under Japanese control. One day after practice, she is approached by her friend named Donnie who has a crush on her. He asks her out on a coffee date but Juliana reveals that she already has a boyfriend named Frank. Later that day, she meets her sister Trudy who had been Mia for the past week. Trudy is happy about something and claims that their life is about to change for the better. Then, we see Juliana meet her boyfriend Frank who is great at art. However, since the Japanese are not a big fan of modern art, he has taken a job as a mechanic in a factory. As they chat, we find out that Frank is Jewish and is always living in fear of the Nazis. This is why Juliana doesn't want to have his children because they will also be subjected to fear every day of their lives. After the date, Juliana is returning home when suddenly, Trudy stops her. She frantically hands her a film and claims that it is their only way to freedom. With that being said, she runs away and is killed by the police a few minutes later. Juliana witnesses this and runs into her apartment before playing the content of the film which is named The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. It shows a world where the Nazis were defeated and how world politics played out after that. Juliana is in shock as the video gives her a taste of freedom and makes her want to fight. After that, we find out that the film is a product distributed by someone named the man in the high castle. Not even the high rankings officials know who he is or what he wants. But he seems to be an ally to the resistance group who has access to things that normal people don't. The government has put a ban on these films but they continue being distributed secretly. Frank arrives home and freaks out upon finding out that Juliana has a film. He wants to hand it over to the police first thing in the morning so they won't be in trouble. 
The next morning, Juliana finds a ticket to Cannon City with an address and a time. It is clear that her sister had to bring the film to that place but now, it is her responsibility. When Frank isn't around, she runs away with the film to the bus station. She also hides the film under another one to cover up the story even if she is caught. In the following scene, we are taken to the German embassy in the Japan-ruled empire. A high-ranking Nazi commander Hugo meets the Japanese trade minister Tagomi who has come to inform them about the arrival of the Japanese prince and princess. Even the German embassy must be decorated according to their taste which doesn't satisfy the Germans. Still, they agree to do it to avoid unwanted tension. Somewhere else, Don has been tied to the ceiling and tortured. The open group in fear and his right-hand man Eric come to meet him but Don remains unbothered by their presence and continues his silence. Meanwhile, Joe's truck stops on the way because of a flat tire. As a kind man helps him replace it, Joe notices ashes in the air. It turns out that somewhere nearby, the Germans are burning mentally and physically disabled people because they don't want to waste their resources on them. After that, Joe continues the journey until he reaches a police check post. In a moment of heat, he brings out a film from under the truck and hides it somewhere else. The police do not find it and set him free. Like Juliana, Joe's job is also to supply the film to someone in Cannon City. Juliana meets a man named Randall who was supposed to meet her sister. He is also a resistance member and thinks that Juliana is not suitable for the job. They get into an argument about who gets to take the film to Cannon City and decide that Juliana should do it because the person receiving the film thinks he is meeting a woman. On her way to the city, Juliana's bag is stolen by a woman who runs away with all her money and the fake film. Juliana continues the journey without money, adamant about doing her sister's job first. At Frank's work, he and a co-worker named Ed are talking about politics. Soon, he and Randell, who Juliana was talking to earlier, are arrested for hiding the film from the police. Juliana reaches the hotel in Cannon City and waits for the person she is supposed to meet. While she is at it, she meets Joe who pays for her meal because her wallet was stolen. They chat for a while and make friends with each other. Then we see Joe making a call to the open group in fear, revealing that he is a spy working for the Nazis and the one responsible for Don's arrest. Back in San Francisco, Frank and Randell are imprisoned and tortured. Officer Keto threatens to kill Frank's entire family if he doesn't reveal Juliana's location by tomorrow. Later, Frank and Randell are left alone and the latter asks Frank not to tell anyone about Juliana because what she is doing is greater than Frank's family. Ultimately, Frank's sister Laura and her two children are brought to the police station and asked to wait in a room. Keto tells Frank that they are about to poison all three of them in half an hour and gives him time to think it over. Then in canon, Juliana and Joe's friendship deepens but Joe has started to suspect that she is a rebel. Juliana starts working as a waitress in the diner. She meets a customer named Alan who is reading a Bible. When Juliana shows interest in it, he gives her the name of a store where she can get the book. She goes to the store while being watched by Joe. At the same time in New York, the open group in fear and his assistant Eric are attacked by a group of rebels. Open Group and Fear manages to kill all of them and arrest a man named Doug to interrogate him. Elsewhere, Juliana meets Alan again and claims that she has something important to tell him. They decide to meet on a bridge at night. Before leaving for the meeting, Juliana gives Joe a letter and asks him to post it to her mother if she doesn't return. Joe calls the Open Group and Fear, asking him to find out about a man named Alan who he suspects of being a rebel. Following the call, he reads the letter where Juliana has told her mother about the wonderful world that the film has shown her. Unable to control himself, Joe also watches the film that he possesses. On seeing an alternate reality, his heart is filled with the will to fight back. Soon, he is informed that Alan is not a rebel but a Nazi spy like himself. Knowing that Juliana's life is in danger, Joe brings out his gun and goes to the bridge. Back in San Francisco, Randell is taken away to be executed. Keto asks Frank to reveal Juliana's location for the last time but he keeps quiet. As a result, a poisonous gas is released in the room Frank's sister Laura and her children are in. Frank is also taken to be executed alongside Randell. Minutes before his execution, Keto finds the woman who stole from Juliana on the bus. Upon discovering the fake film, they assume that Juliana and Frank are innocent. 
Frank is saved seconds before his death but his family dies because of Keto's mistake. Then on the bridge, Alan tries to kill Juliana but is interrupted by Joe's arrival. Juliana pushes him off the bridge and kills him. Right after, she breaks down crying while Joe holds her in his arms. They return to the hotel where Joe helps Juliana relax. Despite the guilt of killing a person weighing her down, she keeps her cool. She inquires if Joe read the letter she left for her mother and he replies with a yes. Juliana doesn't mind because she trusts him and thinks that he did it because he was worried for her. The two have to check out of the hotel as soon as possible because a dead Nazi agent means more are going to come looking for them. They settle on checking out at different times to avoid being suspected. Back in San Francisco, Frank returns to his apartment and goes to sleep. What he has been through in the last 24 hours has weakened him to his core. Ed comes to meet his friend and is glad to see him alive but Frank doesn't show any interest in his concerns. Frank also receives an official letter from the Japanese police about a funeral being held for Laura and her dead children. He then goes to the police station and identifies the dead bodies as his family. By the time he is done, Frank's sorrow has turned into rage. He wants to avenge the Japanese for killing his innocent family. He gets a perfect opportunity to do so when the Japanese crown prince and princess arrive in San Francisco. Upon returning home, Frank gets a call from Juliana but ends it abruptly. He blames her for the deaths and doesn't want to associate with her until his anger calms down. Somewhere else, the open group in fear gets a call from Joe and inquires if he has found more rebels in the diner, referring to Juliana. However, Joe lies, claiming that he doesn't suspect anyone but he wants to wait for a week to confirm. The open group in fear orders otherwise because the rebels should have come by now and their absence only means that they caught on to the Nazis' plan. Joe agrees and goes to a gas station to prepare for the trip back home. Then, we are introduced to another Nazi soldier, Marshall. He is known for killing hundreds of rebels around the neutral zone and is an absolute Nazi propaganda follower. He suspects Joe and asks for his card which causes the two to get into an argument. After confirming Joe's identity the man shows Alan's picture to a bystander. He is the agent sent to investigate Alan's disappearance. Joe quickly meets Juliana at the diner and tells her about his eventful meeting with another Nazi spy. They do not have more time to beat around the bush and need to flee as soon as possible. At first, they search the dam for Alan's body and dispose of it so Marshall won't find it. In the meantime, Marshall goes to the bookstore that Alan often used to visit. The owner Carl claims that he knows nothing until Marshall brings out a card with his true identity. It turns out that Carl is a rebel refugee from Ohio. To save his life, the man tells Marshall about a girl who came to buy the Bible under Alan's suggestion. Despite getting the information he wanted, Marshall doesn't spare Carl and ends his life. Not just that but he makes a statement by hanging his dead body in front of anyone and ordering them to let it rot. After that, he continues his search and ends up outside the diner that Juliana works in. A stranger claims that he knows where Alan is but asks for money in turn for the information. Marshall makes him spill everything he knows and leaves for the bridge having found out that was the last place Alan was spotted. Back in San Francisco, the crown prince and princess are taking a stroll down a park with many councilmen. After the event, the prince privately tells the princess about his concerns regarding the Nazis' growing technologies. They have surpassed Japan in many ways and have to be stopped before another world war breaks out after Hitler's death. In the next scene, we see Trade Minister Togomi talking to a Nazi scientist named Wegener. They are here to make a very important deal that might have a huge impact on world history. Wegener knows the recipe for an atom bomb which Nazis possess but Japan lacks. He is willing to share the recipe with the Japanese science minister so the country can be ready in case they are attacked. Tagomi asks Wegener to hand the recipe to the Japanese science minister on the day of the crown prince's speech because it is when everyone will be distracted. The crown prince and princess go to meet the Nazi ambassador to discuss the speech the prince is about to deliver to a crowd of San Francisco residents. The ambassador suggests they cancel the speech as it might not be entirely safe but the monarch trusts Kido's team to ensure complete safety. No one would dare to lay a finger on him, after all, he is the prince of the entire Japanese empire. Back in Cannon City, Joe and Juliana are disposing of Alan's car when they find a map inside. A marked place intrigues their interest and they decide to travel to see what it is. 
At the same time, Marshall reaches the bridge and finds a drawing of Juliana that she had dropped when she was here with Alan last night. The mistake might cost her her life but she is busy exploring the mapped place with Joe. It turns out to be a camp where the revolutionaries are locked and tortured. The horrifying sight of a chained dead woman shakes them both. Alongside the corpse is a list of revolutionaries who have been killed or are yet to be captured. Trudy's name is also there but what shocks them the most is the name of the diner's owner, Lamuel. This means that the person Juliana has been working with till now is also a rebel. Marshall is in the diner with Lamuel, asking him if he has seen Juliana around the neighborhood. The owner reveals that she used to work for him but lies about her disappearing a few days ago. Meanwhile, Frank is still not in the right state of mind. He continuously tries to gain more information about the Japanese prince by listening to the radio non-stop. Then, we see him making a gun for himself because he works in a factory that manufactures its parts. Ed inquires what he needs it for but Frank doesn't reply. Later that day, Ed catches Frank practicing shooting in his apartment. He carefully inquires if Frank is planning to assassinate the crown prince but doesn't get a reply again. Ed tells Frank to think of every step he takes because he won't be forgiven by the police if he does something irrational. In the next scene, Joe and Juliana are on the drive back to the diner before Marshall stops them. Juliana makes a run for her life and hides inside an abandoned home, all while being followed by him. After a few minutes long search, they come face to face and Marshall is seconds away from blowing her head with his shotgun. But right then, Joe comes to her aid and knocks the Nazi out before running away with Juliana. They hide inside a house nearby, tricking Marshall into assuming that they ran away. Only after he drives away in his car, do they sigh with relief. To seek refuge, they go to Lamuel's home. He listens to their story before asking for the film she got from Trudy. However, Juliana insists that she will only hand over the film to the man in the high castle because she doesn't trust anyone else. Lamuel promises to bring them to the main man the following morning. Joe then surprises us by telling all the information to open group and fear Smith but he doesn't tell him about the part where he helped Juliana. Morning comes and Lamuel brings Joe and Juliana on a hike in the woods. However, halfway in, they are surrounded by a group of revolutionaries who recognize Joe as a spy. He proves his innocence by showing them the film that he wouldn't have brought if he was a spy. Moreover, Juliana also takes his side since he has helped her against the Nazis time and again. Lamuel apologizes for the misinformation and asks them to go to a place on the other side of the hill to stay away from Marshall who is desperately looking for them. Elsewhere, Wegener is preparing microfilm with information about how to manufacture an atom bomb. He is to hand this film to the Japanese science minister during the speech that is about to take place shortly. Hours before the speech, Frank buys a bunch of bullets under the name of a Japanese person living in Tibet. The owner of the shop helps him. When offered an absurd amount of money, Ed finds the loaded gun and tries to stop Frank from doing anything stupid. In the ensuing struggle, Frank is shot in the shoulder but he manages to lock Ed inside a room and make his way to the speech. Juliana is trying to steal a car for their escape but Marshall catches her in the act. She drives away in a hurry causing her to get into an accident that burns her alive. Marshall inspects her burning corpse before confirming that she is dead. What he doesn't know is that it was a plan set by Joe and Juliana to get him off their backs. When everything calms down, Juliana calls Frank but Ed picks up the phone. He tells her everything Frank has been up to, prompting her to take the immediate next bus to San Francisco. Joe watches her go in shock and feels betrayed. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, the prince's speech finally starts. Wegener is in the crowd about to hand over the microfilm to the science minister. Somewhere nearby is Frank getting ready to take his revenge. As he pulls the gun out slowly, someone else shoots the prince before him. The episode ends as he watches the injured prince in astonishment. 